All right. Hello, everyone. Let's see if I can start my video. So uh, my name is Jim Halverson. I'm a physics professor at Northeastern University in Boston. And on behalf of the other organizers, I'd like to welcome you to the virtual edition of Physics Meets ML, a new seminar series at the interface of these fields that is inspired by a meeting uh, by the same name that we organized at Microsoft Research last April. So to begin, I'm going to make a few announcements. Uh, you know some of them, but some of them might be new. I'm gonna give the other organizers an opportunity to briefly introduce themselves, and then Greg Yang will introduce today's speaker. So we have four announcements today. Uh, first of all, official communication. So all official communication for this uh, seminar series is going to happen via our mailing list. So most of you are already registered for it. That's how you got the Zoom link in the first place, presumably. Uh, but if you have friends or colleagues that might be interested in the series, we encourage you to reach out to them and point them to the registration that's on our website so that they can get on the mailing list as well. So as of now, four talks have been scheduled by Taco Cohen today, by Fiala Shanahan on May 20th, by Ard Louis on June 3rd, and by Koji Hashimoto on June 17th. We are planning uh, on extending the series as long as there's significant interest, which we're happy to report now that interest levels are high. So we do anticipate extending the series beyond June 17th. As far as interaction with the speaker goes today, if you have a question during the talk that you'd like answered at the end, please enter it into the Q&A box, not the chat. If you'd like it answered in real time, click on raise hand. Although if there's tons of real-time questions, we'll moderate it and keep it to a reasonable amount. So uh, if you do click raise hand, the organizers can choose to unmute you, at which point you may have to click an additional box that says unmute myself, and then you can ask your question. Uh, finally, the last announcement is video recording. So a number of you have asked about videos of these talks. As a general principle, we plan to post them if the speaker is willing to reach a broader audience and to facilitate involvement from people for whom this 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time is, is inconvenient. There's been a lot of interest, for instance, from people in East Asia, and it's the middle of the night there. So we are recording this talk, just so you know, and we'll post it in the coming week or two. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the other organizers to introduce themselves. Okay, so I'll go first. Uh, I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research, uh, and I do mostly um, research on uh, deep learning, machine learning. Uh, so most of what I do is uh, either robustness of deep neural networks or uh, applying, I think, uh, ideas from mathematics and physics to understand the behavior of deep neural networks. Uh, so building uh, kind of a theory of neural networks. Um, so uh, yeah, we're very happy to um, continue our physical workshop held in uh, MSR uh, April last year uh, in this online format. And uh, Taco was uh, one of the speakers there as well. So we're very looking forward to this talk. And uh, after the, the, the other uh, organizers introduce themselves, I'll also introduce Taco. So Fabian? Yeah, thanks Greg. So I'm a string theorist from CERN and University of Oxford and I'm interested in applying machine learning to understand the questions in string theory or high energy physics in general but also in the other direction. And in the interest of time I'll leave it there and maybe and give it on to Gary. All right, so I'm Gary Xu. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, I'm a string theorist by training as well. So naturally I'm interested in a lot of different things. And I've been working on uh, research problems um, from a wide range of problems from more fundamental aspects of uh, string theory to its applications to cosmology and particle physics. And recently I've been interested in uh, research areas at the interface between theoretical physics and machine learning and more generally data science. So I'm very happy to see that there are over 600 people who signed up to our mailing list. I'm looking forward to interacting with you all. Yeah, hi, I'm Sven. Uh, I'm tuning in from uh, Sven Kreppendorf. I'm tuning in from Munich. Uh, I'm a physicist and uh, yeah, I'm working either on you know, applying machine learning to physics problems, especially in high energy or astrophysics, um, but um, 
Also, I'd like to think about uh, using some techniques from mathematical physics to apply them in uh, machine learning. And so, yeah, it's, you know, has been great at Physics Meets ML, and I hope uh, with this series we can keep the interaction going. And yeah, I also want to keep it short, so maybe I give it back to Greg to uh, introduce Taco. Wait, Gary, did you introduce yourself yet? Yes, you were not paying attention. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, so uh, I'm really happy to um, have Taco here. So Taco is a uh, staff uh, staff engineer, I guess. I guess you got promoted since the last time, huh? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from, they, they, make, uh, they make me put my title there. It's not uh, my, uh, my <laughs> to tell everybody about that. But that's it's good, man. It's good, man. Congrats. Um, so he's a researcher at Qualcomm AI Research, and he's got his PhD from University of Amsterdam under Max Welling. Um, Taco is very famous for his works in applying representation theory and theoretical physics ideas to machine learning, uh, especially his uh, rotation in covariant 3D CNNs, uh, which has found uh, their ways into medical technology recently. Um, so another thing he doesn't tell you very much is he's also famous for being the world champion in mobile phone throwing some like decades ago. Uh, he can, so he can tell us about that in another talk. But um, anyways, in terms of his research, I've always personally found his style of combining math and ML to be very satisfying. And I'm very much looking forward to this talk uh, entitled Natural Graph Neural Networks. Uh, so please take it away, Taco. All right, thanks, uh, Greg, for, uh, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks to all the organizers for, uh, for putting this together. Uh, last year was a very, uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, confluence of string theory and deep learning. So I also look forward to, to the, uh, uh, the rest of these, uh, these talks. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna talk about, uh, not so much about applications of machine learning to physics, although I'll mention uh, a couple examples of that uh, uh, in passing. Uh, but I'm gonna talk more about taking uh, some fundamental ideas from physics uh, and applying them to machine learning and, and deep learning uh, more specifically. Um, and uh, to be precise, I'm going to talk about this idea of symmetry, which is, of course, uh, completely fundamental uh, in physics, but is, uh, is gradually also finding its way into to machine learning. Um, so in the first part of my talk, uh, I'm going to talk about this, uh, this idea in general, uh, symmetry in, uh, in machine learning and how it can help uh, reduce the uh, statistical complexity of learning problems uh, using uh, equivariant neural networks. Uh, I'll give an introduction to the general concepts of symmetry and equivariance, and then uh, give a bit of an overview of, of a number of uh, uh, well, equivariant networks for particular application domains and particular kinds of uh, symmetries uh, to give you sort of a broad overview and, 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 and a general basis in this area. Uh, and then I'll turn to some uh, new work called uh, Natural Graph Networks. Uh, where we try to uh, generalize uh, graph neural networks, which are, of course, finding uh, more and more applications uh, these days. Uh, so generalizing them to be able to compute a, uh, a broader class of, of functions and, and lifting some of the limitations of existing graph networks. Uh, and to do that, again, the, the notion of symmetry uh, plays a fundamental role. And if there's time at the end, uh, I'll uh, briefly go over a, uh, a way of looking at this from a category theoretic uh, perspective, uh, wherein we'll see that the, uh, the, the linear layer of this, uh, this kind of network, in fact, any layer of this kind of natural graph network is a natural transformation between functors, uh, hence the, the name. Um, I'll try to, to uh, keep it accessible, uh, even if you don't know any category theory. All right, so let's get, uh, get started. So equivariant nets, uh, this is a topic uh, I've been uh, working on for, uh, for a number of years. And uh, it all starts with this notion of symmetry. Uh, so I don't have to explain this to the physicist, but just for completeness, I'll, I'll uh, give a definition anyway. Uh, so a symmetry is a transformation of an object that leaves that object invariant. And we're all familiar with uh, sort of geometrical symmetries of simple shapes like this uh, square, for example, uh, we can flip it over that wouldn't change 
uh, the appearance of the of the square and so we say that flipping operation is a symmetry of the square and the rotation by some angle is a symmetry of the of the, uh, the circle etc uh, but of course in mathematics this idea is taken uh, uh, in a much more general sense um, and uh, one can talk about the symmetries of any kind of mathematical uh, object uh, however abstract it may be um, in machine learning, we're primarily interested in the symmetries of probability distributions, uh, label functions, or sometimes if we're talking about optimization, uh, also the symmetries of parameter spaces. So the main example uh, that I'll have in mind uh, today is the, are the symmetries of a label function. So take, for example, uh, the problem of image classification. Uh, we imagine that there is some uh, ground truth function that takes an image and returns the label of the most prominent object in the, uh, in the image. And we know some things about this label function. Uh, for example, uh, we know that if we shift the image a little bit, uh, then the label does not change. And so that's also an example of the symmetry of a label function, a transformation of the input space or transformation of the function that doesn't uh, change it. Um, clearly, if you know about such symmetries, then you should be able to, to make learning uh, easier by somehow building that knowledge into your, your model uh, so that it automatically can generalize, so that it recognizes that if it has seen an object in one location and it has a certain label, if you move it to another location, it has the same label. And of course, this notion doesn't just apply to translations, but any kind of uh, symmetry you might uh, imagine. Um, that, uh, as an idea, is uh, also not, uh, not new at all. Uh, uh, clearly, in physics, this is uh, very important. Uh, in fact, I think physics is the, the case where this is the, has been most fruitful as an idea, uh, in the sense that uh, the laws of physics, uh, in many cases, are almost completely determined uh, by just a, a handful of, uh, of symmetries. You, you, you figure out what the symmetries are, and you have then very little freedom uh, to write down the equations that still satisfy that, uh, that symmetry. So that has been extremely fruitful uh, in the history of uh, physics. Um, but we're going to apply it to machine learning. Uh, and then, and uh, of course, even in machine learning, even though the, the idea of, uh, of symmetry and the mathematics behind it, uh, called group theory, uh, isn't that uh, or hasn't been that per se pervasive, it's, it's, it's uh, growing now in, uh, in uh, importance. Um, uh, nevertheless, over the last couple of decades, uh, people in computer vision, uh, pattern recognition and so on, they have thought about uh, learning or just handcrafting invariant representations. The idea being that if you want to say recognize some, uh, some kind of object in an image, for example, uh, that, that should become easier if the representation that you feed to your learning system, uh, to your classifier, uh, doesn't change when you apply a, a symmetry. Uh, so that's a nice idea, but uh, in the context of deep learning, uh, it's important to realize that this invariance is, uh, uh, is not entirely an appropriate notion, and we want something more general called equivariance. So to illustrate that, I have this, uh, this Picasso painting here, um, and uh, we as, uh, as humans can easily see that uh, there's a face uh, present in this, this image, and at the same time we see that there's something odd is going on, in that the, the, the parts of the object, the eyes and the nose and the, and the, the mouth and so on, they're in a uh, uh, unconventional spatial configuration. Uh, now, if you had a deep neural network where uh, after some uh, initial layers, you would have a representation where you'd have some detectors for eye detector, nose detector, mouth detector, and let's assume that these were invariant, uh, that would mean that we've lost all information about where in the image and in what orientation and scale and so forth uh, these uh, object parts are present. Uh, and uh, if that's your intermediate representation, then the, the, the rest of the neural network that only looks at that representation can no longer tell whether the object parts are in the right relative spatial configuration. And so premature invariance in a neural network is, is not a desirable thing. Uh, and what we want to do instead, in order to still exploit this prior knowledge that we have about the symmetry, uh, is to make the network equivariant. So what that means is illustrated here, which is sort of the, the mathematical, uh, general mathematical setup that we'll be looking at. Uh, what we have here is, uh, uh, on the left, a neural network, uh, which has some input space, x0, say a bunch of images, 
and a number of layers or maps, F1, 2, 3, uh, and so forth, with intermediate representation, X1, 2, 3, and, and so forth. Um, now, what we uh, uh, also have, uh, in addition to these feature spaces and maps between them, uh, is a group of symmetry, symmetries G, which is, could be, say, translations and rotations of an image, or really uh, anything else. Um, and then the final ingredient is this uh, notion of a group representation, or you can think of it as a transformation law. Uh, so this is a map, Ti, that takes an element of the group, say a rotation, and produces an operator that acts on the feature space to essentially apply that transformation to the feature space. Now we say that the network is equivariant if this diagram commutes, which means that if we start out here with our image x0, and let's say we rotate it, that's apply t0 of g, g being a rotation, uh, we get a rotated image. If we feed that to the first layer of our network, we get some intermediate representation. And we want that if we had started with the original image, mapped it through the same initial layer, and then applied t1 of g, we would have obtained the same thing. That's expressed by this equation over here, and that's what we call equivariance. So if this property holds, then we can, can say, we can reason more easily about the, the, uh, these feature spaces. We can say, for example, that two uh, vectors in this, this feature space are, uh, they denote the same object, just rotated or just transformed by some uh, symmetry. Uh, and because of that, that is the case, we can then start uh, recognizing still the relative spatial configurations while also doing clever kinds of weight sharing in order to, uh, to reduce the uh, uh, statistical complexity. I'll talk more about how that works in a, in a minute. Um, so this gives us uh, uh, a design principle for neural network architectures, uh, which can be summarized uh, with this one sentence. We want equivariance to symmetry transformations. Now, I think this is uh, a really a very important uh, point, and I, I always uh, have this uh, slide uh, in my uh, presentations, uh, because right now, I think the, the field of uh, uh, deep learning is in a stage where most architectures are arrived at by trial and error, uh, by black magic, uh, by sort of, uh, uh, you know, it really requires a certain skill of the uh, developer, um, whereas we, so, to summarize, it's an art, not a science. We want to turn this gradually into a science. It's a big task, and this is only one small step in that direction. Uh, but, but by positing this kind of principle, uh, I think we can, uh, we can really uh, uh, make some headway there. So the idea is the first thing you do when you face a new problem is to think about what are the symmetries of this problem. Once you know the symmetries, you can design networks that are equivariant to those symmetries. And that already greatly constrains the space of uh, architectures that you, you might consider. Now, it turns out that even though uh, it, this is not yet such a common idea uh, when stated this explicitly, nevertheless, a lot of the uh, most successful architectures do indeed uh, respect the symmetries of, uh, of the problem. So a couple examples on here. If uh, we have images, for example, or one-dimensional audio signals, the go-to uh, our class of architectures is, of course, the, the convolutional network. Uh, and uh, as we all know, these are uh, equivariant to translations, which is exactly the right kind of uh, symmetry for those problems. If you additionally have rotations, you can use rotation equivariant GCNNs. Um, signals on graphs, and one, one of the things I'll be talking about uh, mainly today, uh, as well as point clouds. There you have uh, some uh, uh, notion of the permutation symmetry in that, the, for example, the orders the order of the points in a point cloud uh, is generated, say, by a LIDAR on a self-driving car. Uh, that order of points is, is not really meaningful. It's just a set, a collection of unordered points. And so because you still have to represent it in some order in your computer, the function that you're going to compute on this should be equivariant to permutations. Uh, we have a generalization of these ideas to homogeneous spaces, like spheres, for example. Uh, and uh, lately, also, we've been working on general manifolds, where uh, it turns out you need to take into account the, the local gauge symmetries of the, of the space. All right, so that's, the, that's the, some generalities on equivariance and symmetry. Uh, let's look at a couple examples. So the simplest example uh, that we published uh, in 2016 is what we call now the regular uh, 
GCNN or Group Equivariance Convolutional Neural Network. Um, and uh, the basic idea here is to just take a convolutional network, which uses uh, convolutions for the learnable layers, and replace those convolutions by so-called group convolutions, convolution on a, on a group. Uh, that's, of course, a, a well-known mathematical operation that had not been used yet uh, in, uh, in the neural networks. And uh, in this slide, I'm showing uh, how, what this means concretely for a particular very simple group, namely the group of translations and rotations by multiples of 90 degrees. So what we have is our, we have our image here uh, uh, on the top left, and we have a convolution layer uh, that has two filters, uh, and let's say an eye detector and a mouth detector. These are the parameters that the, the model is going to learn. But let's say it's learned to detect eyes and, and mouths. And a typical convolutional network would slide this over the image and record at each position the uh, response. And so in this case, you would get two large responses uh, where the actual eyes are and the mouth detector would respond where the, where the mouth uh, is. Uh, but unlike a, co a general convolutional net, a standard convolutional net, we're going to not just apply the translations, but we're working with roto translations. So we'll uh, also rotate these filters by uh, 90 degrees and then convolve again, rotate again, convolve again, rotate again, convolve again. And so now for the same number of parameters, whatever, however many parameters are in these filters, uh, we get four times as many feature maps um, and uh, thereby we, we can reduce the statistical uh, complexity. Now the equivariance is manifest as follows. If we take this image and we rotate it by 90 degrees uh, and then apply the same operation, now what's going to happen is the uh, rotated versions of these filters are going to pick up on the same features, only now in their rotated position. Um, and so the key thing to observe here is that uh, as we, that in this, so if you go from the top right to the bottom right, uh, and you ask, okay, how did these feature maps transform as we uh, transform the input? Uh, well, what happens is that the feature maps get rotated. So the eyes, for example, used to be on a horizontal line over here. Now they're on a vertical line over here. So the, the feature maps get rotated. And in addition, there's a cyclic shift uh, along the, uh, the channel dimension. And that's a really key thing that we'll uh, see uh, coming back in, uh, again and again. Now, of course, you can do this uh, not just for this very simple group, but for, for many kinds of groups. Uh, people have implemented this for continuous transformations uh, uh, at this point, and uh, many others that I'll uh, cover in the next slides. Um, so one example is uh, in three dimensions, still considering only uh, uh, discrete rotations. And here, things already get, uh, get quite interesting. So what you see here in this, uh, this diagram is uh, you see a three by three filters and all the possible rotations uh, of this, uh, this filter that you can make. Uh, these are generated by two transformations, uh, rotations around the z-axis, that corresponds to the red arrow, 19 degree rotation around the z-axis, and a rotation around one of the diagonals, which corresponds to the blue uh, arrow. Uh, and as you can see, there are 24 uh, of these uh, uh, rotations of the, of the cube. And so now you get 24 of these orientation channels uh, for the same number of uh, parameter, parameters, which corresponds to a huge uh, uh, increase in uh, statistical efficiency. Uh, so we tested this on the task of pulmonary nodule detection in CT scans, uh, which can be used to screen uh, uh, at-risk populations like smokers for, for uh, lung cancer. Uh, and we found basically that uh, this kind of model gets about 10x improvement in data efficiency. Uh, which means that if you train a GCNN like this on N samples, you get roughly the same uh, accuracy as if you train a conventional CNN uh, on about 10 times uh, more samples. And that holds across data set sizes. And the conventional CNN baseline was trained with data augmentation and all the usual tricks. It was pretty much uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, architecture. And so this, uh, this translates into significant uh, uh, savings in terms of uh, data labeling uh, cost and can potentially uh, unlock certain applications that would otherwise not be economical. Um, here's another example that I really like. Uh, uh, this is uh, DNA sequences. Um, so DNA has a certain kind of symmetry, uh, namely if you have a 
uh, DNA double helix, there's two ways to read it. You can either read it from, let's call it the top strand. It's not correct terminology, but there's a top strand. You can read it from left to right or the bottom strand from right to left. Um, and because these strands uh, are on e at each position, there are these uh, complementary base pairs, the, the A and the T and the C and the G. Um, uh, the, the symmetry that you have is that you have a sequence here uh, and it's equivalent to a sequence where we reverse the order. So where we go from left to right here, we can read it from right to left on, on the bottom and we substitute each letter for its uh, complementary uh, partner. So that's a symmetry. These sequences of letters really denote the same physical piece of DNA. And uh, these guys, Lunter and Brown, showed that uh, indeed, if you incorporate this kind of symmetry into a neural network uh, that is uh, used for uh, prediction of recombination hotspots and binding motifs, don't ask me what that means, but uh, if you do that, you get uh, improved performance. And so this is, I think, it's a very nice example of, of the value of abstraction and the power of mathematics uh, in that I had no idea uh, that this kind of symmetry exists in DNA data, but because uh, we wrote this for a general group of symmetries, G, uh, the, the same theory still applies uh, here. Um, now, um, as you saw in the previous examples, in the regular GCNNs, it's the case that the number of orientation channels that you get is equal to the number of elements in your group, or if you're dealing with a continuous group, the number of points in your discretization of that, that group. Uh, and that's good from a statistical perspective, but it can be uh, computationally costly if your group becomes very, very large. Uh, so fortunately, fortunately there's, a, there's a nice solution to this. Um, and the basic idea is to, uh, instead of taking your feature maps to be a function on the group, as we do in the regular GCNNs, we take it to be a field on some base space. It, for example, the, the three-dimensional Euclidean space, as in this example. Um, and the dimensionality of this field can be much lower than the number of elements uh, in your group. So here you see an example. In the, on the top, we have a scalar field. It shows some table. This is, a, say, an object, 3D object recognition task. We have a scalar field where at each point is three-dimensional space. There's some intensity value. Uh, and then we have our neural network, which produces these two uh, fields. It produces, as an intermediate representation, a scalar field and a vector field. And the scalar field, well, it behaves just like the, the input. Uh, someone's asking, what is the base manifold? So here the base manifold is just R3. Uh, so three-dimensional Euclidean space. It's a projected in 2D, of course. Um, so, um, right, so what you see is that this intermediate, the scalar feature map is transforming exactly like the, the input. And this is just one single channel uh, rather than a whole bunch of orientation channel channels. And nevertheless, this uh, clearly shows the, the equivariance property. And on the bottom, you see a, a vector field. Uh, so a vector field has an interesting transformation law in that what happens when you rotate a vector field is the vectors, they move to a different position, but they also change their orientation. Whereas a scalar ch stays unchanged, uh, this vector changes orientation and that is mathematically described by some representation uh, row of the, uh, of the rotation group. In this case, a three by three matrix that acts on the X, Y, Z coordinates on the three channels uh, in your convolutional uh, feature maps. Uh, and that number three is not linked to the, to the size of the group. It can be really pretty much anything. Uh, there are other methods like harmonic networks, tensor field networks uh, that have been independently uh, discovered and uh, have uh, essentially the, the same kind of idea. If you look at it abstractly enough, these are uh, uh, very much the, the same. Um, and um, yeah, they're called steerable CNNs because it turns out that the equivariant linear maps between these kinds of uh, uh, spaces of fields are always expressible as convolutions using so-called steerable filters, which have quite a history in signal processing and uh, computer vision. All right, so here's, a, here's an, another example of that. So uh, this is uh, uh, from a uh, repository created by uh, Gabriel Cesa and Maurice Weiler for uh, E2, so Euclidean Equivariant Networks. Uh, and what you see here is contrasted the convolutional net and a uh, GCNN. 
uh, both take as input this, this image, which is undergoing a rotation, and the conventional CNN produces this uh, single feature map. Uh, but you see that when you back rotate this feature map, it's actually changing all the time. It's not stable. Uh, and so whatever this neuron is doing, uh, it's detecting one feature in one orientation, say the top of the roof or something, and then it's detecting the road when the road is in another orientation. And so it's not very consistent about what it is detecting. And therefore we could say it's not really meaningful uh, uh, in a way. Whereas the GCNN is, is consistent. It uh, consistently detects, uh, let's say this negative activation where the grass is. Uh, it also detects a vector field, uh, which is also rotating. And when you stabilize it, you see that uh, nothing changes. Uh, I see some questions, but uh, uh, why is the neural net on E3 not a CNN? Um, it is a CNN, but we call it the GCNN. So it's a, it's a convolutional net with specific uh, weight sharing that makes it equivary. And yeah, there's this, uh, this other uh, repository for, uh, for the three-dimensional version that I linked to at the, the bottom here. Uh, created by uh, folks at Berkeley, uh, Tess Schmidt and uh, Mario Geiger and others. Um, so, so far I've talked about flat spaces. You can also play this trick with uh, curved spaces, such as for example, spheres. So data on spheres uh, emerge in, in a variety of fields like earth and climate sciences. You have signals on, uh, on uh, the earth. Uh, you might have an omnidirectional camera. Uh, on a robot. In cosmology, you might have some, uh, let's say, microwave background radiation or other physical data from the sky. Uh, and for this purpose, we, uh, we developed uh, spherical CNNs, which are equivariant to three-dimensional uh, rotations of spherical signal. And by now, many, many other uh, spherical CNNs have been uh, published, uh, many of which are actually uh, probably better algorithms that, than uh, what we proposed uh, initially. Um, so here's a, here's a picture to show why you really, really need this when you're working with uh, uh, spherical data. Uh, so here is a feature as an input image. We've just taken the, the world map. Of course, uh, in reality, you might have something else like a temperature field or a wind direction field or something like this. Um, but we take this uh, image in the center and when we rotate it around that one axis, uh, basically in this planar projection, it looks like a cyclic shift along the X axis. But when we rotate around the y-axis, you see a quite drastic distortion. You see that the, uh, the south pole here, which is this white strip, is turned into uh, some uh, approximately circular blob in the center of the image over here. And to a conventional translational convolutional network, those two shapes look completely different. They're not translations of each other. So uh, you'd have to do heavy data augmentation, and even then you likely wouldn't completely uh, uh, be able to, to recognize these things as the same thing. So for a spherical CNN, those things are essentially indistinguishable, uh, but because of the mathematical properties of the, the network, because of the active variance, which is uh, displayed uh, on, the, on the bottom here. Uh, so recently, uh, we have also been working on uh, convolutional nets on general manifolds. And manifolds that are not homogeneous spaces like the sphere, where any two points are related by some symmetry transformation. Um, and uh, although I don't have time to, to explain all of this, uh, here you have a bunch of cool pictures to hopefully entice you to, to look at the papers. The, 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 the one line summary is that in order to uh, build uh, a well-defined uh, linear map between fields defined on some general manifold, you need to take into account the uh, the, uh, the frames that you're using to represent the, the field, uh, i.e. the gauge, and you need to take into account gauge transformations uh, uh, in order for this to be uh, well-defined. Are there any applications in drug discovery? Um, yes, actually. Um, so the, um, both the three-dimensional uh, e E3 equivariant CNN that, that, folk, that work on these uh, dense voxel grids, as well as the, for example, things like tensor field networks and, and variations of that, which operate on sparse uh, point sets, as well as graph neural networks, actually, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, can be uh, and have been used for drug discovery. Um, but I'm not really an, an expert on that. But the, the basic idea being that you take as input some molecules and you try to predict 
whether they uh, are likely to bind to certain receptors or uh, whether they're likely to have some kind of uh, activity in the, in the body. Uh, there are a lot of questions, so I'm not going to be able to answer everything uh, and uh, read it at, uh, read it while speaking. So sorry if I missed it, but I'll try to answer this uh, later. Um, yeah, and the final example uh, that I'll talk about mainly today is uh, graphs uh, and well related to that point clouds where you have permutation uh, symmetries. Uh, and I think I've already mentioned this: the the, the fact that uh, uh, that uh, the order of the the nodes or the points in this uh, these collections are not meaningful, and so your network shouldn't depend in any essential way on the point. All right. So finally, uh, there are a number of the general theories that I think, particularly for this audience, could be very interesting because the underlying mathematics is is really just straight from a physics textbook. There are a lot of interesting. Uh, connections there and uh, sort of the two main uh, questions that uh, uh, people are looking at uh, are the following firstly there's uh, you know neural nets are built as a sequence of linear layers and nonlinearities and the linear layers they have a, uh, a parameterization and what you would like is to uh, be sure that the linear layer that you're using is first of all equivariant but uh, beyond that constraint that it's maximally general linear map uh, and so you, in, in a way you want to classify the linear equivariant maps between two uh, representations uh, and that is a task that has been undertaken for a number of special cases in the, in the papers below uh, the other the other question uh, is that of universal approximation and so we know for general neural nets that they are uh, universal function approximators, meaning if you make the hidden layers wide enough, uh, then the um, then a, a neural net can, in principle, approximate any continuous function. And you might want to ask the same thing about the class of equivariant functions. Can this equivariant network approximate any kind of nonlinear equivariant but continuous function? Um, so in the case of homogeneous spaces, the first question was uh, uh, covered by these two papers by Condor and Trivedi, who covered a case of uh, uh, scalar fee, uh, scalar fields on homogeneous spaces, and uh, by uh, by us uh, for the case of these general fields, vector fields, tensor fields, and so on. Uh, and uh, of course, as usual in machine learning, we don't produce any new math. We're about 50 to 100 years behind the mathematicians, and in this case, uh, George Mackey. In actually in the 50s uh, first um, found these results in one form or another while investigating quantum mechanics and, uh, and other uh, uh, aspects of physics where these uh, fields of course also play an important role. Um, theory for manifolds is coming up and uh, there are a number of results uh, in this category for graphs, sets and other kinds of uh, discrete structures as well. All right, so now we come to the main part of the talk, natural graph networks. Uh, so this has been a collaboration with uh, Pim de Haan, a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam and research associate at Qualcomm, uh, and Max Welling. Uh, and I should say that uh, uh, Pim has really been the, the driving force behind this, uh, this project. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, just to be clear about that. Um, so first to motivate this, uh, so graphs are everywhere. Uh, we have the World Wide Web, telecommunications networks, social networks, molecular graphs, that's uh, the thing that might appear in, in a problem like drug design, uh, as well as materials uh, uh, design. Uh, knowledge, we have knowledge graphs when, uh, when you're trying to reason about these large uh, knowledge bases. Uh, you might represent that as a graph. Roadmaps, protein interactions, you name it. Graph is just a very uh, convenient data structure for representing all sides of, types of information uh, where relations are important. Um, now we know that fully connected neural networks are good at processing vectors, but not every uh, piece of data is a vector. You know, GCNNs are good at processing spatial signals or fields on some base space uh, where we have some geometrical symmetries that play a role. Uh, and for graphs, of course, we need a special network that respects the relevant symmetries uh, for the graph. Um, so uh, graph convolutional nets uh, in their simplest form uh, work as follows. We have here a simple uh, graph for illustration. 
with a bunch of nodes and edges and associated with each node is some uh, feature vector. Uh, in fact, in each layer, each node has a feature vector. Uh, and the way that we compute the next uh, layer activations for each node is by sending messages from all the neighbors uh, and then summing them up. So here we have node Q with uh, output uh, feature vector YQ at a given layer. And to compute YQ, we just sum over all the edges, so all the messages from neighbors. Uh, we sum the messages, and the message is just the feature vector at the neighboring node times a fixed weight matrix W, which is uh, learned. Uh, and that's it. The good thing about this is that because of the summation here, uh, this is invariant to permutation. So if I order, reorder my nodes, uh, I'm going to get the same output. Uh, so it does not depend on some arbitrary ordering of, uh, of nodes. However, uh, this kind of uh, uh, scheme has some uh, limitations, as was shown, for example, in this paper by uh, Zhu et al., how powerful are graph neural nets, where they show that, in particular, on uh, regular graphs, uh, these networks have uh, uh, limited uh, power. So, for example, these two graphs, which are clearly different, um, they cannot be distinguished by such a simple uh, uh, message passing neural network. So that's a bit confusing. We, have, we thought we had a constraint which our network must satisfy, that it's, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't depend on this ordering. But somehow when we impose that, we get limited uh, expressivity, uh, which, um, which uh, suggests that maybe we need a more subtle understanding and loosening up those constraints a little. Uh, here's another example of a, of a limitation of, of uh, current uh, graph networks which is that basically the source of information uh, is forgotten at each, uh, after each message passing step. So what we have is a graph here with a bunch of uh, nodes sending uh, information, sending messages to the central node, which then sends it on to this uh, final node. And let's say this, at this node, we want to make some kind of classification. Well, in that case, uh, the two signals represented here on the left and the right which are different because we see that the colors here at the nodes are, are different between the two cases. Uh, they again cannot be distinguished because once you sum up all the messages in this central node, uh, the order of these uh, adjacent nodes is, uh, you know, is irrelevant. So this, uh, this node can never tell uh, where the information came from and so never distinguish between these two uh, situations. All right, so that brings us to, uh, to our method, uh, natural graph networks. And just to contrast them with uh, conventional graph networks, uh, here's a, a, a you know, one slide summary before we dive into the details. Um, so again, here's the equation for the conventional graph CNN. And the only thing we're changing is that we're essentially untying the weights. So these Ws are the same on every edge. Uh, and in our case, uh, we have a kernel K, which is also a matrix. Uh, but it now depends on the graph as well as the edge, the edge from P to Q uh, that we're working with. So there will be certain constraints on this thing, but a priori it's just a different matrix for each edge. Um, this uh, approach is invariant under permutation of neighborhoods, uh, of neighbors, whereas our uh, met method is actually sensitive to the permutations of neighbors, which allows it to uh, you know, remember where the information came from. Um, in this case, the kernel is independent of the graph, whereas in our case, it actually depends on the graph. And here's a really key thing. The kernel here is restricted by a permutation group, whereas in our case, it's uh, restricted by the symmetries of the graph. We'll talk about more about that in a, in a minute. And that leads to limited expressivity in this case, because the permutation group is a much larger group. Uh, and this is, uh, is the, the most general kind of linear uh, activariant map. Um, all right, so let's talk about graph equivalences and symmetries. So the key notion here is that of a graph isomorphism, which is just a uh, mapping between the node sets of, these, uh, of two graphs. Uh, it's an invertible mapping that has the property that if there's an edge between any two nodes uh, in the uh, uh, input, then those two nodes are mapped to nodes in the output graph that also have an edge. 
And intuitively, it just means that they're the same graph, that they don't change in any uh, meaningful way, uh, except perhaps how the nodes are labeled, how they're ordered, etc. But it's essentially the same graph. Um, now, a graph may also be isomorphic to itself in a non-trivial way. So, of course, every graph is isomorphic to itself via the identity isomorphism. But if the graph has a symmetry, like in this case, we can, for example, flip node one and three, uh, and that will preserve the edge structure. It's an isomorphism uh, from this graph to itself, which is also known as an automorphism or just symmetry. All right, so then we come to the, the, the key uh, requirement. Uh, we want our uh, layer to be equivariant. So if we have here a graph with some uh, labels for the nodes, that's how we're gonna store it in our uh, computer. Um, a list of, uh, of numbers and uh, pairs of numbers for the edges. And we apply our convolution layer. We get uh, some, uh, some new values indicated by the colors here on the nodes. Then if we apply uh, an uh, uh, isomorphism, uh, to this uh, equivalent graph, uh, where now the nodes are labeled differently and the layout in the plane is a bit different. Uh, if we then apply our convolution, then we should get something that is equivalent, i.e. if we apply the isomorphism to the, to the output, uh, we, uh, we get the same result. So this just shows that, that the, the layer should only depend on what the actual, you know, on the actual graph structure, uh, rather than some arbitrary ways of how we implement it or represent it. And that brings us to, uh, to this idea of equivariant message passing. Um, so here we have a graph, it uh, doesn't have any kind of uh, global symmetry, uh, but um, we, uh, we know that in, in message passing, we're only gonna, you know, the, the output is only gonna depend on local neighborhoods anyway. And so we're gonna consider these local neighborhoods here. Uh, for each edge, we're gonna define such a neighborhood. Here I've highlighted two of them. Uh, this uh, edge between P and Q, and another one between P prime and Q prime. And as you can see, uh, the neighborhoods here, they actually are isomorphic as graphs. Uh, and so the, the basic idea underlying this work is that we're going to share weights between isomorphic neighborhoods. Furthermore, these neighborhoods, they may themselves have a symmetry, i.e. they may exist an automorphism, uh, as you can see here. This, this one, uh, you know, you can flip over the graph and it, uh, it stays the same. All right, so um, we're gonna introduce some, some kind of generalized notion of a gauge. Uh, so the way you can think about this is uh, for, for any given node, say P, uh, we're gonna assign some arbitrary labels to the uh, neighbors of this, uh, this node. Um, and uh, we, we, as I said, it's arbitrary, so we could also choose another way, such so as for example here, we have a different uh, labeling of the, uh, of the neighbors. Uh, nothing has essentially changed except our representation. Um, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna attach to each node a, a feature vector whose dimensionality is equal to the number of neighbors uh, that it has. That's just a, a choice. In the more general formulation, this uh, would just be a vector that has some representation of the symmetric group on n elements, where n is the number of neighbors. Here we just choose that to be n-dimensional. Um, and uh, when we relabel the, uh, the neighbors, i.e. change the gauge, then there will be some uh, uh, you know, permutation, in this case, rho of g, g being the, the gauge transformation, uh, applied to this, uh, this feature vector. Uh, this idea is actually similar to uh, what was proposed by Condor et al. in their co covariant compositional networks, um, and also to uh, uh, what we did for uh, manifolds uh, in gauge equivariant series. So here's an analogy to perhaps better understand this. So let's say we, the nodes are actually people in a, in a family, and they're uh, talking to each other via a certain uh, uh, graph. Uh, and we have, uh, let's say, the, the, the son says, uh, gives them a sense of message to the mother saying, uh, what X, you know, whatever that is. And the mother considers it important to pass this on. Uh, and so sends a message to the daughter and the father. Uh, but the message is different. To the daughter, she says, your brother told me X. 
And to the father, she says, our son told me X. And so the key point here is uh, the mother is referring to the same person by different labels uh, because these two people, the daughter and the father, they have a different conventional way of referring to the, to the, uh, uh, the people in, this, uh, in, the, in their vicinity, uh, i.e. as the father thinks of this person as his son and the daughter thinks of it, uh, that person as uh, her brother. And so the mother is taking into account the, the, the labels that these, uh, uh, these people use for this uh, one person. So that's, uh, again, this, uh, this notion of being able to remember where the information came from and having a different addressing system or gauge for each uh, node. All right, so then we come to the, um, to the weight sharing idea. Uh, first, the idea of uh, weight sharing by isomorphism. So we have here, uh, again, we zoom in on a single node P, uh, which has a neighborhood in, in dark blue with certain uh, labels. And uh, this uh, uh, neighborhood may be isomorphic to another neighborhood in our graph. Where, as you can see here, uh, the outside the neighborhood, the graph has a different structure. Here we have two neighbors, and here we have one. Uh, but the neighborhood itself is isomorphic. Um, and um, as we map this feature vector through this isomorphism, we get a you know, different but equivalent one uh, here at this place. And now we want that if we apply our operation, uh, uh, a convolution, uh, which is perhaps a misnomer, but uh, our, our layer to this, uh, uh, to, to this graph, um, we get an output four-dimensional because the node, node Q here has four neighbors, uh, if you include itself as a neighbor. Um, and uh, that should be uh, the same thing as what you get by applying the convolution on the, uh, the isomorphic neighborhood, uh, except that they might be related by this, uh, this isomorphism, which in this case exchanges uh, certain nodes. Um, now, that, that seems natural enough, but of course, uh, again, thinking about the symmetries of these neighborhoods, there might not be just one isomorphism, but there might be many. And if that's the case, uh, you might ask, okay, well, how then do we do weight sharing, right? How do we take a kernel defined on this neighborhood and uh, map it to a kernel defined on this, this neighborhood if there are multiple ways to do it? Well, the answer is to just uh, uh, impose all of these constraints. And that's really equivalent to um, uh, imposing this, this constraint for the uh, automorphism group, which is shown in this slide. So here we, we look at, um, again, at the same node P, we have our convolution, uh, and now we have an automorphism. So we have a transformation of this neighborhood that maps it onto itself by uh, uh, flipping these, uh, these two, uh, two nodes. And if we apply convolution here, we want that this to be, uh, to be the same as first doing convolution and then applying the automorphism. And one can show that if you have this, if you satisfy this property for all the automorphisms in the automorphism group of this, uh, this graph, uh, then uh, this, in, this potential inconsistency about, okay, which isomorphism would I have to use to, uh, uh, to uh, do the weight sharing between different positions in the graph that is now resolved, that's no longer an issue because any two isomorphisms between these neighborhoods will be related by some automorphism and the automorphism uh, uh, doesn't matter. It's, it, the network is equivariant to these automorphisms. Um, and so it will always extract the same information but only represent it differently depending on how you label the neighbors in a particular neighborhood. Um, so solving this, uh, this constraint, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, automorphism equivariance constraint, uh, tells us in this particular case where we had this uh, message going from P to Q from a five-dimensional, five-neighbor, sorry, five-neighbor neighborhood to a four-neighbor neighborhood. We have this five by four matrix, uh, and uh, we get this kind of weight sharing scheme where the dots represent free parameters and the labels uh, represent uh, tied weights. All right, so here's the algorithm. So oh, okay. the first step, Good. this question? Oh, no, it is, I, I was gonna ask for this, but you're presenting it, so it's great. Okay, uh, so the algorithm is as follows. Uh, you begin by defining node and edge neighborhoods. Uh, and this must be done in a consistent, i.e. isomorphism invariant way. 
a uh, simple thing so you can do is say for each node, I just take the all the nodes in uh, that are at most k steps away, uh, plus all the edges uh, in there, and that, that's my, my neighbor. That's one example. There are many choices. Uh, and now what you're going to do is you're going to classify these edge neighborhoods into isomorphism classes. Now, testing for isomorphism can be expensive if the graph is large, but in typical applications, the graph is at least, these neighborhoods at least are pretty small. Uh, and furthermore, we compute the automorphism group for each of those uh, uh, isomorphism classes for each type of edge neighborhood. Uh, that gives us a constraint on the kernel, as I, I indicated on the last uh, few slides. Um, and uh, this is just a you know, bunch of linear constraints. So you solve it with SVD or something. Uh, you get a basis for the space of solutions. Uh, so now we have kernels K, G, P, Q, indexed by I, where I uh, is you know, however many independent solutions there are. For each I, we introduce a parameter alpha I uh, that we're going to learn. And then um, at, uh, uh, at training time, what we do is we linearly combine these independent basis solutions for the kernel using the learned weights as uh, coefficients. Um, then we transport that kernel defined initially on the, some canonical version of the neighborhood to all the isomorphic neighborhoods that we have in our graph. Uh, and then we compute this convolution. I, we just multiply the matrices by the feature vectors and sum everything up. And that's it. So it's not, not uh, uh, very difficult to, uh, to implement. Um, so this is related to prior work. Uh, so for example, if you choose the node neighborhoods to be trivial, or if you use a trivial uh, representation instead of this permutation representation for row, uh, you get back a conventional graph C then. Uh, if you choose a rectangular grid or some a nice a symmetrical grid on the icosahedron, you will get a planar or icosahedral uh, CNN as published in these two papers. Uh, if, which is in contrast with the conventional graph CNNs, which when you apply it, for example, to a planar graph, it would only be able to use isotropic, a rotation invariant uh, filter, so blob-like filters, whereas this one can learn uh, general filters. Uh, it's also related to Condor et al., the covariant compositional networks. Uh, in their case, they, uh, they have node neighborhoods that actually grow in size with the depth of the network, uh, which I think is in principle also possible in our framework, but it's not necessary. And the main, the main uh, difference really is about the, uh, the fact that in their case, the kernel is constrained by the permutation group, uh, which is a much stronger constraint than uh, constraining it only by the automorphism group. Um, and it's also related to Maron et al., the invariant and equivariant graph networks, uh, where they actually represent the whole graph as a linear structure uh, and ask for permutation uh, equivariance, but this is not a, a message passing. All right, some quick synthetic experiments. So here we have the example again, the networks that can, can uh, the graphs that cannot be distinguished by conventional uh, uh, graph CNNs, as you can see here, the loss remains high, whereas the natural network very easily learns this. And similarly, this, this uh, limitation is also a uh, result. So this, uh, I should have said this, but this is very preliminary work. It's not out yet on, uh, on archive, uh, but it will be in about a month or so. Uh, here's the, the first experiments we did on the QM9 data sets of, uh, data set of molecules, where the goal is to take a molecule represented as a graph with nodes for atoms and uh, edges for bonds and uh, to predict various uh, physical uh, chemical properties of the, of the molecule, which have been computed using some very expensive uh, computations. Uh, and the goal is to, to try to predict those using a very fast neural network so that we can then uh, do those computations cheaply for new molecules. And among uh, message passing algorithms, uh, two columns here, uh, we're comparing uh, favorably using this very, very simple uh, initial uh, version of our method. Uh, uh, it's not yet state of the art, which is the, uh, the incidence network, but this is not a, uh, a message passing uh, algorithm uh, based on uh, local filters. So we're looking into how to further uh, uh, improve this. All right, so quick summary. Uh, graph networks must respect graph symmetries. Graph symmetries are not, uh, are automorphisms. They're not just uh, any permutation of the nodes. 
And uh, by exploiting these local symmetries, we obtain a more powerful kind of, uh, of graph network. Um, given the time constraints, I think I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I have some slides on uh, the mathematical theory, but uh, I think you're going to have to wait for the, for the paper. Maybe very briefly, uh, here's uh, the one slide summary of the category theoretic formulation, uh, which uh, gives a very general description of both these natural graph networks, as well as the homogeneous GCNNs like spherical CNNs, as well as gauge CNNs. And the basic ingredients are, first of all, defining a category of node neighborhoods where you have objects that are, uh, the, uh, let's say, points, points in a manifold, nodes in a graph, whatever, and arrows, which are morphisms, which are ways of transporting data between these, uh, these points. Uh, we have a category D of edge neighborhoods where the objects are messages or, for example, edges in a graph, and the arrows are local symmetry or, or weight sharing conditions. We have uh, functors F0 and F1 that just map uh, an edge or a message uh, to the source and target, the beginning and end node, for example. You could show that this, uh, this somehow defines a functor. And uh, we have a principal groupoid, certain kind of category, uh, uh, and, a, and a category of associated feature spaces uh, on nodes uh, where uh, we, can, we can take uh, these, uh, these um, more, but we have a functor from this category of node neighborhoods to this principal uh, bundle and from the principal bundle to the associated bundle. This is somehow defines your, uh, your feature space. And then the grand finale says, okay, the, the, the network layer is nothing other than natural transformation between these two functors. Um, now, I don't, under, don't assume anyone understood that, but I uh, uh, hope it's a good teaser for, uh, for when the paper comes out. It, the, the, and, and really the, the key message that I take away from this is that uh, this is not just some you know, nice idea that we came up with, but it's, 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 um, it's natural. Let's uh, uh, say it okay. Right, so a lot of math that you don't have to worry about. Uh, just gonna go to the conclusion. So uh, I've told you that uh, equivariance is a very natural design principle for neural networks. It's applicable in a very wide range of domains, such as planar images, signals on homogeneous spaces, uh, as well as manifolds, graphs, and who knows what other structures uh, uh, in the future. Um, we've introduced this new framework, natural graph networks, that is uh, fundamentally more flexible than invariant message passing methods on graphs. Uh, and uh, uh, I've given you some hints about the mathematical theory that underlies this, uh, which uses some elementary uh, notions from category theory to, uh, to give a very general description of all of these uh, kinds of methods. Um, so with that, uh, I'm, uh, I'm gonna close and uh, happy to take questions. Hey Taco, so you should have um, some questions that are waiting for you to answer live. So you can just pick the questions that you like to answer and go through sure. them. Um, so sh I have two uh, boxes of questions over here. Um, but uh, let's look at, uh, look at the Q and A. Yeah, so uh, uh, Owen Yang asks uh, at the beginning of the talk actually, in practice, how to properly fill the gap between the continuity of symmetry operations and the discrete nat nature of data slash signals? Uh, this is a very good question. And uh, uh, when I started developing uh, GCNNs, uh, I actually initially tried to do it for continuous rotations and uh, didn't work. And so then uh, as the deadline was approaching for ICML, I said, okay, let's just do the simple thing and write a really clean paper. It's a little bit, a bit limited, but okay. And I wrote this uh, for, uh, well, we implemented GCNs only for discrete uh, groups. And that still is by far the simplest uh, method and it's, it's, it's very effective. Um, it gets you most of the way. Uh, but uh, people have shown that uh, introducing, um, you know, more finer rotations, for example, can, uh, can improve results. And the way that, uh, well, there's, there's just a lot of uh, detailed, careful engineering work to, that, to get the numerics right. Uh, you need to think about sampling theorems, making sure that the filter doesn't have such a high frequency content that um, uh, by rotating it, you would get ABSing artifacts. Um, there are a number of papers that go into this. Uh, Eric Beckers had, has uh, written some. Um, uh, Gabriel Cesa has done a lot of work on this. Uh, that's part of the um, 
the E2 CNN library that I mentioned. I think that's a very good implementation to, to look at. Uh, and they have a paper on how to do this properly as well. All right, so that's about discrete versus continuous. Uh, there will always be some kind of approximation error, but it, it's, uh, it seems now that uh, people have figured out how to do this uh, even in fairly deep networks without too much uh, artifacts. Um, question again by Owen, uh, by using vector and tensor, one could enrich the representation. But why channel transformations are necessary in image problems where symmetries have only geometrical meaning? Right, so um, basically, uh, how, how shall I explain that? So basically, if you say that your, your feature space is going to be a vector field or a tensor field, it immediately implies that it has some kind of uh, transformation law, which does indeed involve this, this, uh, uh, this channel transformation. So that's something you really can't, uh, can't really get, uh, get rid of. So question by Deepak Vaid. So uh, conventional translational CNNs are just gauge CNNs with the symmetry group, the group of translations. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a certainly a, it's a regular GCN for the group of translations. Um, and uh, you can also think of it as a gauge CNN uh, with a trivial structure group. Uh, if you read the, the papers on this, uh, you'll know what exactly that means. But uh, yes, there are special cases. And the more, more generally, all these, these things that I've presented, you can think of that as one big chain of generalization from CNN to a GCNN, regular GCNN to a steerable GCNN, which includes the regular GCNNs, to gauge CNNs, which works on, uh, on manifolds as well. Can you, uh, can you encode symmetry in your loss function instead of changing architecture, i.e. using just feed forward network with different losses that impose the network to learn symmetry? Um, yeah, so uh, it's a, definitely an appealing idea. Um, I haven't seen it being done successfully yet. There's uh, some small number of works that make some attempts, but I don't think that these methods are yet very practical. Uh, of course, there, uh, what is widely used is a uh, technique of data augmentation, where you just apply the transformations to your input uh, and then train your network on that. Uh, but this really introduces only a constraint on the network as a whole, rather than a constraint on each layer to process the information in a, in a sensible way in the context of symmetries. Uh, and um, uh, moreover, it, it's basically impossible to, during your training, exhaustively sample all the transformations for all the data points. And so in practice, what we find uh, repeatedly is that if you compare a GCNN trained with or without data augmentation, compared to a conventional CNN with data augmentation, the GCNN tends to outperform. Would natural graph neural networks benefit from introducing geometrical inductive biases? Like say, for example, representing them on curved manifolds. That's a very good point. Uh, so here in this paper, uh, because we realized indeed that, that this de uh, dealing with the continuous nature of certain kinds of data can be very tricky, uh, we said, let's make our life easy and just deal with graphs uh, as graphs. And in some cases, your data really is a, just a graph. Uh, if it's uh, some uh, communication, some, some, let's say some social network, for example, that, that's, that's undeniably a graph uh, and uh, there's no real geometry there. Uh, but actually in many applications uh, uh, where people use graph representations, that the data is actually of a geometrical nature. So the molecules are actually an example of that. Uh, the atoms there have a position in space uh, and there's distances between these atoms and so on. Uh, and I feel like, uh, yes, in principle, the right thing to do is to, 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 well, assume this geometrical structure and then build the right network uh, for that. Uh, in practice, the graph networks work uh, quite all right, even for those cases. Uh, if you properly encode some of the geometrical information in the, in the feature vectors. Um, uh, we do have a number of papers trying to uh, implement gauge CNNs for, for example, meshes. Uh, and um, uh, as I also mentioned, the tensor field networks, for example, they, uh, they try to also take into account this, this geometrical structure. 
but I would say that as of right now, uh, we don't have sort of a perfect method for the for the geometrical data, especially if it's sparsely uh, sparsely sampled in, in space. So the jury is still a bit out on this. Question from Neil Day: uh, Is this equivalent, in some sense, to the gauge equivariant mesh CNN work? Right. That's uh, uh, similar to the last question. So. Um, the answer is no in one sense, in the sense that uh, in that uh, paper, we actually do take into account the geometrical nature of the work. A mesh uh, is like a graph, but uh, each node has a position in, in space. And uh, also the, the, the nodes are grouped into triplets that form triangles. And so that, that's really geometrical information. And so we tried there to, uh, to take that into account as well. Uh, so in that sense, it's different. Um, but in another sense, uh, it, they're uh, part of the same framework, which is this very general natural um, uh, neural network framework, where by defining these uh, uh, node neighborhood and message neighborhood uh, categories differently and the, defining the functors in differently, etc., you can view them as different instances of the same abstract uh, construction. Are these methods on graphs scalable to large graphs? I, I think the uh, answer is yes. What is not scalable is the computation of uh, isomorphism classes. Um, that's a you know, fundamental computer science problem known to be hard. And, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you can keep, just keep those neighborhoods small. And then yes, in principle, I th I'd say it's uh, uh, about as scalable uh, as uh, conventional graph networks, modulo some uh, some uh, implementation details that you would need to uh, to optimize. But there's no no fundamental uh, um, uh, roadblock, I think. What's the expected time proportion between pre-computation and training phases of the algorithm? Um, well, uh, I think uh, again, if the if the neighborhoods are small. And you have a fairly efficient implementation, then the train the pre-computation can be relatively quick, and training, you know, especially on huge graphs, it could be uh, you know days on a GPU. So it's going to be the pre-computation can be negligible, uh, I, I think, in most cases. Question by uh, Rene Vidal: uh, Is design by equivariance at odds with over-parameterization? Specifically, of course, it is very natural to start with desired invariances and design a network that satisfies those invariances. This reduces the number of parameters, eliminates need for data augmentation, etc. However, from a learning perspective, it seems better to train bigger over-parameterized networks. They seem to be easier to optimize and generalize better. That's a very interesting question, actually. Um, uh, of, I don't have a special theoretical insight into that, uh, but I can say that in practice, we actually find that uh, these regular GCNNs in particular uh, are actually much easier to train. And so the, the fact that, the, so, the, so that, that, that's, a, that's an empirical observation. Um, now, I would also say that even if you use an equivariant net, you can still over-parameterize, right? You can use as many uh, hidden units as you want. It's just that the, uh, the ratio between the number of hidden units and the number of parameters, that, that is going to change uh, from CNN to GCNN. Um, and so you can also wonder about how much of the effect, the effect of over-parameterization helping optimization is due to a wide uh, hidden layer size versus having a, a high dimensional parameter space. Uh, to that, I don't really know the answer, except that, uh, again, uh, we find empirically that GCNNs are much easier to optimize in the sense that you need far fewer optimization steps uh, to get to the, the end results, um, possibly because of increased weight sharing, where, whereby each parameter gets a signal from uh, multiple feature maps. But uh, interesting question. Uh, Hossein uh, asks, in natural graph networks, are you uh, gaining expressivity at the expense of introducing lots of new parameters? Uh, is it applicable in real world graphs? Well, that's a very good question as well. So in the, in the formulation that I've given now, uh, it's the case that each uh, isomorphism class of a neighborhood has a, a different set of parameters. 
Uh, that can be a large number of parameters if, uh, uh, or a small number, depending on how symmetrical the, the graph is, this neighborhood is. But uh, the key thing is if you have many kinds of neighborhoods, then um, uh, you're gonna have many more parameters. Uh, of course, that's always a trade-off. If you wanna be more flexible, you're gonna have to have more parameters. So in one way, that's a good, good thing. If you have large neighborhood sizes and a huge uh, messy real world graph, where you know even one node could be different and then the neighborhoods are no longer isomorphic maybe that's that's not optimal and so indeed we are looking at ways to again increase the the weight sharing uh by uh not having these things completely untied but uh, somehow factorizing this uh this structure um and i think there's a very large design space uh that we that can be explored for for how to do that uh, in different contexts how to to think about approximate uh, isomorphisms and uh, all this kind of thing. There's there's a lot of uh, future work there. So. Uh, thoughts on Wolfram's recent works towards a supposed fundamental theory of physics. Um, no. <laughs> uh, are there significant implications to these category theory memberships beyond the implied equivariant? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I think category theory is a very nice framework for, for thinking about structure. And I think it's, uh, it's the future of deep learning. Deep learning is all about composing of uh, comp composition of maps. And category theory is all, also all about composition of maps. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm excited about it. Uh, and I think that uh, people uh, sort of, uh, think it's some very, very abstract nonsense because that is indeed how it's often uh, used in pure mathematics, but it's something that anyone uh, uh, with a computer science or math background can, can learn and uh, I think it's very applicable. Um, so I hope that kind of uh, answers the question. Uh, isn't it possible to solve the problem with permutation invariance of graphs by embedding the edges and nodes in a way that respect their hierarchical importance uh, or position um i don't know i i uh, don't immediately see a way to do that but uh, um, if you have a concrete proposal uh, let me know or uh, or write a paper about it i think that could be uh, interesting um question by joseph uh can the kernel constraints be solved numerically yes and that's indeed what we do so we we numerically represent these matrices row uh, and we um, we stack them basically in a, to a big matrix of uh, constraints, and then we literally call SVD or uh, or uh, you know linear solver uh, on that. So that's actually good news because you don't want to be doing all that by uh, by hand, and uh, it's not necessary. All right, uh, question by Georgios. Uh, can you quantify the expressivity of this model? For example, universality or something more relaxed equivalence to a, a WL test. Uh, I guess that's Weisfeder Lehmann. Um, yeah, so um, we thought a little bit about this and we don't have a complete answer. Um, our sense is that uh, if you choose all these, uh, if you choose all these, um, uh, uh, well, there are a lot of free, a lot of choices still about how you define these functors, how you define the neighborhoods, etc. cetera. Um, the, I think with the appropriate choice, you should be able to, to distinguish uh, any graph. Of course, it's gonna cost you because now you have to solve this graph isomorphism problem and that is uh, costly. So in a way you're sort of cheating there. Uh, but I'm, I'm th I think that the, the framework itself is flexible enough to, to support um, uh, isomorphism testing, I guess. Uh, but really, I'm just guessing here. Uh, so the real answer is, it's a great question. Uh, we need to study that and uh, that's left for uh, future work for now. And then question, how to, any intuition on how to choose K, the number of hops for your neighborhood in the graph? Yeah, um, no, not really. I mean, it's gonna depend a lot on the, the type of data that you're, you're working with. Uh, as well as, of course, your budget um, uh, of uh, compute for the pre-computation. It will scale exponentially if you, um, if you make it very large. And um, 
it also affects the amount of weight sharing you get because if you have a small neighborhood then in general you'll tend to have uh you know more um more symmetries um and also you'll have uh, fewer distinct possible graphs of some limited size uh, and as you increase k you're going to have more uh, distinct graphs and more, more, more of them are going to be um, uh, non-symmetrical and then owen uh, yang asks for gcn does one need to manually find all isomorphisms or automorphism uh, yeah for so for for, well, for a classical uh, Graph convolutional net, the answer is no, you just pass messages. But for what we introduced, the, the natural uh, graph network, uh, yes, you need to, well, manually, not like, not literally manually, but there is a, there's a piece of code that, uh, that computes these, uh, the isomorphism classes of neighborhoods, and for each one computes the automorphism group. If there are some information on the edges, like edge weights, can these be taken into account? Uh, yes, so not in the, the formulation as I've given it here, but uh, you, you, there, there's natural ways to extend this to, uh, to do that. Yeah. Uh, question by Robert Jan Schlimbach. In the E2 CNN paper, train time data augmentation such as FLIP is still used. But isn't one of the advantages of equivariant networks that this train time data augmentation is not needed anymore? Um, so, I'm, I'm not sure anymore uh, exactly which paper this is. I think maybe by uh, Cesa and Weiler, but um, one argument could be that you just want to keep everything the same between the baseline CNN and the GCNN, and you do it like that. Another could be that if the numerics aren't quite right, so it's not exactly equivariant, then training with data augmentation can still help a little bit, although I think with flips, uh, you probably wouldn't have that issue, though with rotations you, you, you might. Um, also, I think that some papers on equivariant nets write that it's an advantage that we don't have to use data augmentation, uh, but um, I think there's not much of a downside to using data augmentation. You can, it's, so it's, almost, no, it's not exactly free, but it's, it's a pretty cheap thing to do. Uh, there's a lot of code that does it for you, so it's easy to, to incorporate. Um, so I think if, if it weren't the case that GCNNs were beating CNNs with data augmentation, I think it would not be useful, but they do in practice. And then, yeah, you can add data augmentation to the GCNN if you, if you like. Uh, usually it doesn't add much, but sometimes it adds a little bit. Um, then uh, David Romero asks, I don't really know if it is possible in real applications, but what if there's noise between edges? For example, connecting two not connected nodes. Is there a way to handle those situations uh, as it entirely breaks the iso-automorphisms of the graph neighborhood, maybe in hierarchical isomorphism structure? Uh, could the idea of Oliver Ricci curvature help make them method immune to these kinds of manipulations? I actually don't know much about that uh, uh, Oliver Ricci curvature, but uh, yes, uh, this point, I, I mentioned it before briefly. Um, this method really is, uh, you know, again, in the form that I've presented it here, at least, it's, it's uh, quite strict. And this is going to probably work in things like molecular graphs, where you have certain specific motifs that happen exactly uh, in, in multiple uh, molecules like benzene rings or you name it, some, some motif that the network can pick up on and recognize exactly. Uh, in other cases, um, again, take social network, it's going to be very messy and they're never going to see the same situation exactly twice. Um, and yeah, there's, uh, there's more thinking to be done for incorporating, uh, well, for, for generalizing to those situations. I think you can think of it as uh, two extremes on a spectrum and the graph the standard gcnn is sort of on one end where all the weights on every edge in every graph uh, is shared and then the other extreme is where you maximally untie the weights and uh, in practical applications you likely want to be somewhere uh, in between in natural graph networks question by yun lu there could be overfitting problems when some types of nodes have only very few cases, is it? Yeah, that's, a, that's the same. So you need regularization or uh, additional weight sharing uh, between non-isomorphic neighborhoods, some kind of soft weight sharing. 
Hossein uh, asks, isn't it possible to solve the problem with permutation invariance of graphs by embedding the edges and nodes in a way that respect the hierarchical importance of position? So to fi fix the problem via smarter node edges. I think this is similar to question before. Um, and uh, I don't quite know the answer, but uh, again, it's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, David asks, I don't really know if it's possible in real effort. Oh, this is again the same question. Uh, Anonymous asks, in the training phase, kernels of different neighborhoods that appeared in the training data are learned. How can a natural graph network deal with neighborhoods in the test data that has not been seen before? Again, uh, you need uh, further weight sharing and uh, uh, we're looking at uh, different ways of uh, doing that. Uh, is the activation at a node equivariant to the group at that node or equivariant to all the groups at all the nodes in the neighborhood? Um, so it's, act, it's equivariant to permutations of the, of the node neighborhood. Um, but as a consequence, the network as a whole is equivariant to permutations of all the nodes or automorphisms of, of, uh, of, the, of the whole graph. Um, but but you get that sort of automatically because the whole construction is uh, is uh, isomorphism invariant. And that's the last question. Uh, if there are no more uh, questions, uh, I think we can uh, can leave it at that. Thanks everyone Hi. for your attendance. <laughs> thank you, Taco, very Thanks, much. Every, uh, thank you, everyone, wherever yeah. you are in the attendance. Be sure to give a clap for Taco. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in person. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Taco. That was really wonderful. Um, uh, it was a great start to this seminar series, and we continue in two weeks with Fiala Shanahan, who's a physics professor at MIT. She's going to tell us about building symmetries into gener generative flow models, uh, which has applications in lattice field theory. So, all right, thank you everyone very much. Please uh, keep an eye out for emails from us, and we hope to see you at the next talk. And Taco, thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Taco. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.